You think I'm joking, right? Anybody else think it's a new year? Um, for the church, the Advent season, the start of the Advent season, is the end of one year and the beginning of the new year. And so for Christians long ago, um, they would have celebrated the new year right now. And of course, the rest of the world or the rest of the empire at the time would have celebrated um, at the end of December, beginning of January, like we all do nowadays. So it sounds strange to say Happy New Year, but uh, for the Christians, this is the new year. And uh, it feels kind of like that, right, in the, in the church today. I was so excited when I came in because um, when I left yesterday, I had to take Justine home. And when I left yesterday, um, I think Rob was laying under the tree. Uh, and there was just pieces of tree all over the place, and people had hammers and drills, and it was an open question if anything was ever going to get done. And then you come in this morning, and it's lit up and decorated, and it's, it's great to see that. Um, it's very exciting. Well, um, I don't know if any of you have expectations for Christmas, expectations for the new year that's coming. Um, since we're talking about New Year's, for me, I've got one. I'm looking forward to Disney World. That's right, we're going to Disney World. Um, take, we're taking Justine uh, to Disney World, and this will be the first time that she can remember uh, going there, so that'll be fun. We took her once before, I think she was like two and a half, and um, she just cried the whole time because it was hot, we went in the summertime. It'll probably still be hot even though it's January, but um, anyway, that's Florida nowadays, it's always hot. Um, but, I don't know, everybody has, uh, probably most of us have been to Disney at least once in our lives, and um, everybody has their favorite places, right? Their favorite uh, parts of it. For me, it's the Magic Kingdom is, is the best. I mean, I like Epcot too, but um, the Magic Kingdom is really the, the fun place where I have all the fun memories as a child, you know, going to different places. And as a, as, a, as a boy, I used to love, there was a, lot, a number of rides I liked a lot. I liked the old 2,000 Leagues Under the Sea. I don't think it even exists anymore. But I used to love that submarine and getting in that thing and, you know, getting attacked by the giant squid and all that sort of thing. And, of course, Tom Sawyer's Island. It wasn't, there wasn't much to the ride, but I, as a kid, I loved taking the raft over to the island and then going in the cave and sneaking around and, you know, Tom Sawyer's cave and all those kind of things. But, of course, there's only one ride if you're a boy at Disney World. Pirates of the Caribbean, right? I mean, the original. I'm not talking about after the movies. You know, the ride that was so good, they made a movie about it, right? Not only one, but a whole series of movies. And, um, you know, that was always the best. The good old Pirates of the Caribbean going in there. And... Um, you know, when I was young, they didn't have this thing called Fast Pass. So um, going to the Pirates of the Caribbean always meant you were going to be in line for at least an hour, maybe an hour and a half, right? Do you remember those days? And, um, and the good thing was they had air conditioning, right? And they have uh, all kinds of decorations. So even though you're in line, you're waiting in a long, long line of people, but you start to have this kind of expectation because... You start seeing cannonballs and cannons and pirate flags and stuff as you're weaving your way through the building on your way to the ride. And there was always this one sign I was waiting to see. And when I saw the sign, I knew that I was getting close to the Pirates of the Caribbean experience. Do you remember the sign, buddy? Not that one, the other one. Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. <laughs> you know, I just knew that we were just getting ready to get into that deep, wet darkness that is the Pirates of the Caribbean ride. You know, you come out smelling like you've been inside of an air conditioning, drippy air conditioner or something after you finish the ride. But, um, you know, that was always the sign for me that we were getting, we were about there, was that sign. Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. And uh, it turns out this phrase is, has a long history. Um, Disney Corporation didn't just make this up. It actually comes from Dante, Dante Alighieri, who wrote uh, a very famous book. If you were alive in the Middle Ages, everybody was reading this book. It was called The Divine Comedy, but it wasn't really a comedy at all. 
if you read it, it's real depressing, honestly, big parts of it, um, because it is about someone who is lost in their life, and they go through this experience of, of hell, they go through hell and kind of get a tour of hell, and then they go through um, purgatory and the Catholic idea, the place where people waited for thousands of years until they were good enough to finally get into heaven. So I don't know exactly why he decided to call it the comedy, but there wasn't a lot of funny stuff about it. Um, what's that? It ended well. It ended well, maybe. So at the end you were like, oh, phew, I made it. Right, so maybe that's why. Um, but this <coughs> phrase um, actually comes from um, an Englishman, um, H.F. Carey, in 1814, who did the English translation. And he came up with this phrase, you know, abandon all hope, or actually it was originally all abandon hope, ye who enter here. That was his translation of the Italian. Um, and so anyone who has experienced depression, anyone who's gone through a bad phase in life knows this feeling of having no hope, um, that when you go into certain situations in life, you can go through an experience where you feel that you're hopeless, and there's nothing worse than feeling hopeless. Um, there's nothing scarier than literally losing hope and having no hope in your life. I mean, when you have no hope, you feel you have no future, you, you don't know how you can look forward to anything, you don't know how to um, take the next steps in life. Sometimes you don't even know how to get out of bed, right? Have you ever had those days where you're just like, oh, it's so far to the floor, I don't think I can make it, right? It's just complete paralysis, this feeling of hopelessness that you have abandoned all hope at your point in life. And of course, if this kind of depression is left untreated, it can lead to sickness and even death. And hopelessness can become a kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy, we might say. And we're on the subject of prophets today, um, on the opposite of hopelessness, but we're on the subject of hope. And we've talked a little bit before about prophets. We've talked about who prophets are and what they do. Typically, we think of prophets as people who predict the future, right? That's the famous idea of a prophet, someone who predicts the future. So in our culture, we talk about prophets who can guess what the next technological trend is going to be or what's going to happen to the economy. Um, political prophets kind of guess what's going to happen between the United States and China and North Korea. And, and if their ideas come true, we say, wow, that guy was a prophet. He was able to predict what was going to happen. But originally, the meaning of prophet just meant someone who could speak the words of God, someone who could speak God's word to others. And so a pastor could be a prophet in a way, right? Um, anyone who speaks, interprets, explains God's word, a Sunday school teacher could be a kind of a prophet, right? Um, that was the original meaning of the prophet. Someone who puts their lives on God's agenda and not on their own. Well, for the sake of argument for today, um, since we're talking about this hope and expectation, let's think of prophets in that typical sense that we usually do of people who receive some kind of message from God about the future. We read a few texts this morning, one from a famous Old Testament prophet, Jeremiah, and one from a young woman of the New Testament, maybe someone we don't usually think of as a prophetess, Mary, the teenage mother of Jesus. Jeremiah was the prophet um, to Jerusalem. This is a picture of him, uh, this small picture there. Um, he was a first-hand witness of the destruction of Jerusalem at the hands of the Babylonians. He had a really hard job. I mean, he had to basically tell people Sorry, but this whole country is going to get destroyed. And unfortunately, he was right. And he had to watch it all happen. He went through one of those terribly hopeless experiences. I mean, can you imagine seeing the future and knowing that it's going to be a disaster and there's just nothing you can do about it except for tell other people who don't believe you anyway, right? Until it's too late. Um, there was a, a 
a few years ago, a Nicolas Cage film called Knowing. It was kind of like that, you know, where someone had figured out all these things about the future, and it had to do with all these disasters. And when he finally figured it all out, there was nothing he could do about it except just watch it happen. And that's kind of the experience that Jeremiah went through. Just a horribly hopeless experience. But in chapter 33 of his prophecy that we read, Jeremiah suddenly gets a new message from God. Suddenly his prophecy kind of turns a corner and goes in a new direction. It goes from the absence of hope, from people who have no hope, to a message of hope and restoration. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good promise I made to the people of Israel and Judah. In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout out from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is a name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteous Savior. People on the verge of abandoning hope received a message of restoration new hope for the future. Luke chapter 1 introduces us to a young prophetess, we might say, Mary, um, the expecting mother of the Savior, Jesus Christ. Now we, we usually don't think of Mary as a prophet, and the verses that we read today are usually called Mary's Song. It's, um, some people have argued that the first few chapters of the Gospel of Luke are musical, because we get so many songs, you know. Uh, Zachariah is singing a song, and then Elizabeth is singing a song, and then, you know, Mary is singing a song, and somebody said, this is like a musical. There's so many songs going on in these first few chapters of Luke related to the Christmas season. But if we listen to those words carefully, there's something prophetic about what Mary is saying. My soul magnifies the Lord. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. His mercy extends from generation to generation. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised to our ancestors. A message of hope from a prophetess, predicting future blessings, proclaiming the deeds of God and his promises. Now, what is it that makes someone a prophet? What, if we think in the future sense, what is it essential part of the characteristic of a prophet? What kind of character does a prophet have to have? What do people like Jeremiah and Mary and the other prophets of the Old Testament Isaiah, Ezekiel, even the New Testament, John the Baptist? What do they have to have to make them candidates for speaking God's word to their people? Faith, I would say, of course, and trust in God. But I would say that deep down, maybe the most essential thing is that prophets have to have hope. They have to expect God to do something. If God gives you a message, especially about the future, you have to hope that you will see the result that God has been speaking to you about. You might remember in the New Testament, the old prophets Simeon and Anna, people we meet in Luke chapter 2, when Jesus was brought to the temple for the first time. They were people who were hoping that they would see the salvation of Israel. And God had promised before you died, they were old, you know, they were in their 80s, 90s. In those days, people didn't usually make it much longer. And they were told by God, you will see the salvation of Israel in your lifetime before you die. You will see it. And they were waiting. They were hoping. They were filled with expectation. And when they met that child, at the temple, their hearts were filled with joy because their hopes were fulfilled. A true prophet has to have hope, even one like Jeremiah, who suffered so much with his people. To abandon hope means to give up on God. 
A few years ago, I heard the story of a man named Hussein, not a very popular name for us in America, probably. Um, but Hussein uh, is from Iran. He lives in Iran. And he was raised in his family's religion of Islam. A few years ago, he found himself addicted to drugs and thinking of killing himself because he had lost all hope in life. But someone introduced him to Jesus Christ, and he put his faith in our Lord and became a strong believer. And so, what should he do next? He was wondering, what kind of life should he live as an ex-Muslim turned Christian in a country like Iran, where doing such a thing could be punishable by death? I mean, did God just want him to live an undercover life as a, as a secret believer in Christ? Or, or was, he be called, was he being called to something more, something better? After praying and asking God's direction, he felt God was calling him to quit his job and his normal life and prepare for some kind of ministry. But he didn't have any idea what could he do as an ex-Muslim in a Muslim nation where Muslims are not allowed, not permitted <coughs> to become Christians. While he was thinking and praying about it, Hussein was invited by a Christian couple involved in Christian ministry to just come with them on some of their visits and follow them around and observe their ministry as they visited people's homes and, and spoke to them. And so, and so Hussein said, well, that sounds okay. I could probably do that one without getting in too much trouble. And so he did, and he was hoping that he would see what God had in mind for him. And so Hussein and this, and this couple went to visit a Muslim family in their home. And when they arrived, they were met by a young lady. And as soon as they walked in the door, this woman just started crying right in front of them. And Hussein said, oh, this is horrible. You know, I just started to think about ministry, and as soon as I walk in, I'm making people cry. So he was feeling terrible about the situation. But the lady said, no, you don't understand. I've heard about people who have visions of Jesus Christ, and, and I prayed for a vision like that. And just a few days ago, I had a dream, and Jesus appeared to me. And in the dream, he invited me to a table and asked me to sit down with three people I had never seen before. But now, I see you for the first time. And so in the vision, the woman had seen this couple and Hussein sitting at her table. And now when she met them, she was overcome with emotion. Two things changed that day. The young woman, the young Muslim woman, also became a believer in Jesus Christ, just like Hussein. God had shown Hussein that he had a vision and a plan for his life. He had gone to that house with the hope that God might have something in mind for him. And he left as a man dedicated to a lifetime of ministry. Today we live in a world that is abandoning all hope. Um, the news that we listen to, whether it's local or national or international, could drive us to despair with, with the endless tragedies and wars, economic problems, mass shootings. <coughs> Some people say it's better not to have any hopes at all because at least that way you're never going to be disappointed. Maybe that's true. You'll never be disappointed if you have no hope. But you'll never have anything to look forward to either. No expectations. No dreams. No plans. But Advent is a season of hope. Not just a hope for, for new gifts or, or new hymns to sing or a, or a decorated sanctuary or a new recipe to try out, as good as those things are. But Advent is a season of hope in the presence of Jesus Christ. It's a reminder that Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us. A reminder of that earliest proclamation of faith in Christian history, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We are called to hope in his presence. 
We're called to hope that he is still working in this world in spite of all that we see happening around us. And we're called to hope that he is coming again. Where is your hope this Christmas season? Maybe you're feeling something like you're in line at the Pirates of the Caribbean, you know, that you're on the verge of abandoning all hope. And today we come to this table that is the source of our hope. A table where Jesus Christ meets us in the midst of our fears, our hopelessness, our stresses at this time of the year. Let us prepare our hearts and spirits to come to this table in repentance. Abandoning all hopelessness, ye who enter the presence of the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this season of hope. We thank you for speaking through prophets like Jeremiah and Mary and modern day prophets, the pastors and the Sunday school teachers and the people who speak your word to us and remind us that there is hope for each one of us. Forgive us for the ways that we <clears throat> let the culture around us direct our ways of thinking and, and maybe guide us into a path of hopelessness. We ask as we come into your presence at your table that we might experience the hope that only you can bring to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.